Welcome to an RTR production of Respond to Racism's monthly community meeting, April 3rd, 2023. The guest speaker today is Reverend Dr. Randy Woodley. The topic is the indigenous spirit weaving justice in a wounded land. In this meeting, Reverend Dr. Randy Woodley explores racism and our relationship with the earth. He currently serves as the Distinguished Professor of Faith and Culture at Portland Seminary and Director of Intercultural Indigenous Studies. My name is Willie Poinsett, and I am the founder of Respond to Racism. Welcome to our monthly community meeting. We're glad to have you join us as we learn together, get tools, and take steps to respond to the racism in our community and our country. Tonight, Jeremy Watson, one of our Respond to Racism board members, will be reading the land acknowledgement. Jeremy? Today, I would like to honor the people whose lands we live on, the Molala, the Cayuse, the Tualatin Kalapuya, or Atfaladi, Willamette Tumwater, Wasco Rishwaram, Clackamas Chinook, and the other Chinook people of the Willamette area. We acknowledge those tribes as the original inhabitants of the land and recognize that we are here because of their forced removal from this land. Land acknowledgments are more than just explanations name-checking the tribes and Native nations whose lands we occupy. That is not enough. These statements help demonstrate respect for and awareness of the enduring relationship between Indigenous people and place. Acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or a historical context. Colonialism is a current, ongoing process, and it behooves us to seek and to build an understanding of our present participation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Our mission to educate and empower Lake Oswego residents and institutions with the tools to combat racism in all its forms and make Lake Oswego and Oregon a better place to live for residents of all races and ethnicities. And now a favorite part of my time is to give gratitudes and acknowledgement. We want to first start with Dr. Melissa Hafner. She was our speaker at our last community meeting. Thank you. Thank you to Catherine Phelps, who was the leader of our story time, the time with early uh, elementary school children and the stories. Thanks to Mary's Woods and partner organizations for hosting the BIPOC Women's Series Speaker Series. Special thanks to our March 23rd speaker, Tracy Lamb. She was the last speaker in that series. A thank out or a shout out to our Silent Walk participants. It's powerful when we walk together in silence. Thank you again for walking. Thank you to Gloria Brown Scholarship Committee and to those who have donated money. We are happy to be able to announce that we have two scholarships we're giving to this, this year, $2,000 scholarships, two, 2,000, no, not $2,000 two, the number two for 2000. I'm trying to be clear when I put the words together. And the applicants must apply by April 15th. So if you know of people who are a senior that's eligible and for the details, you can go to our website and look up the Gloria Brown Scholarship for more details. But the deadline is April 15th. And now, with, as we get to our meeting, the meat of our meeting, we have some agreements and some expected outcomes. Our agreements are to be brave, share ideas, ask questions, and engage in conversation. Let others speak, 
respectfully listen to understand and be open to new ideas. Share your unique perspective and speak honestly. Critique ideas, not people. Ask clarifying questions. Respect each other's thinking and value their contributions. Honor confidentiality. Expected outcomes for tonight. We'll get acquainted with who's in the room and wanting to respond to racism in LO. We won't solve racism in two hours. You'll leave the meeting with more questions than you came with. You'll have one actionable item and you'll have more ideas of how you can interrupt racism. And now I'm going to turn over our program to a person close to our hearts. He has spent three decades in the entertainment industry, working for some of Portland's top radio stations. And as a performer alongside many major artists, you may know him as DJ Avalanche. But for tonight, he's wearing another hat as our moderator. Please welcome Denmark Whitaker. Thank you, Miss Willie. I appreciate it. I hope everyone can hear me just fine. Um, tonight, tonight's program, The Indigenous Spirit, Weaving Justice in a Wounded Land. Um, we, I'd like to introduce to you guys, Reverend Dr. Randy Woodley, PhD, recently retired as Distinguished Professor of Faith and Culture at Portland Seminary and Director of Intercultural Indigenous Studies. Dr. Woodley is a Cherokee descendant recognized by the United Kituwa Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma. I do hope I pronounced that correctly. Edith and Randy Woodley are co-sustainers of the Aloe Indigenous Center of Earth Justice and Aloe Farm and Seeds, a regenerative farm, school, community, and ceremonial grounds in Yamhill, Oregon. And they have four grown children and six grandchildren. At this time, I'd like to bring up Reverend Dr. Randy Woodley. Are you there? Can you hear him? Is he unmuted? I am here. Thank okay. you. All right. I want to make sure that I had you there. <laughs> first things first, before I get started, um, how can we address you correctly with respect to your accomplishments and achievements? I want to make sure that we do that. Uh, yeah, I'm okay with whatever is comfortable for people. Um, my students generally just call me Randy or uh, some of them refuse that and call me Dr. Woodley, but I'm, I'm okay with Randy. All right. I'm just a I just, I just yell out, Doc, you, you're okay with it. Doc's fine. <laughs> Again, I wanted to make sure to, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge all your accomplishments. And speaking of which. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to uh, also apologize for that uh, introduction being so brief because there's so much that you have done. We would be here for hours just trying to explain it all. But you know, some has have referred to you um, as an activist, a scholar, a distinguished speaker, teacher, uh, wisdom keeper, as well as co-founder and program director of the NAIITS George Fox Master of Arts uh, Intercultural Studies degree. Wow, a lot there. Yeah, yeah. These are all you know, sort of like I just retired, so. All this seems like uh, sort of in the past. Now I'm just an old farmer. So, <laughs> well, that's uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today. Um, I, I read some things about you, all of which are absolutely amazing, and I'm sure, like everyone else, you know, in this meeting tonight, we are just excited and chomping at the bit to hear from you. So, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. And okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me here this evening. Um, I'm going to try as we get to 8.30 not to yawn too much because that is my bedtime. 
So uh, hopefully we, we won't be going much past that, but uh, um, but I'll I'll be here. I'll be hanging in with you. Um, yeah. So so I've been asked tonight to sort of uh, park the bus, if you will, at the corner of racism and climate change. And uh, I have particular views that I've developed over the years uh, of these things. Um, I think the most uh, concise way of doing that is to uh, share a PowerPoint with you. And, um, and then after that, uh, we'll have that question and answer time, which I really look forward to. Uh, first part of the PowerPoint will be um, dwelling more with racism and the second part more with climate change. But it, uh, that first part is actually where we set the groundwork for the connection or the intersection between the two. So if I'm set up for share screen, then, which I am, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring that up. So this is just some ways that you can contact me afterwards or stay in touch with the things that I'm doing. This slide will also be at the very end of the program. So um, if you're interested in things like our podcast or seeds or anything like that. So, and these are just some of the books that I've written. Yeah, so, uh, you know, pay attention. I try to uh, uh, give both a visual and non-visual sort of representation as we're going along here. There should be some interesting photographs there for you. So I'm gonna read a few things, um, some perspective. Uh, one of the quotes I love by James Baldwin is, uh, American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. And I, I sure believe that all of that. The village that you see there is a, is a recreation of my third great grandfather's village of Teleco that is now under the uh, Tennessee River as of the Tennessee Valley Authority um, project. John Kennedy, I was surprised to find in a children's book about Native Americans, John Kennedy wrote, some very wise words. He said, for a subject worked and reworked so often in novels, motion pictures, and television, American Indians remain probably the least understood and most misunderstood Americans of us all. Collectively, their history is our history and should be a part of our shared and remembered heritage. When we forget great contributors to our American history, when we neglect the heroic past of the American Indian, we thereby weaken our own heritage. We need to remember the heritage of our forefathers found here and from which they borrowed liberally. And I really like the fact that, that he referred to Native American uh, ancestors as forefathers. Martin Luther King Jr., our nation was born in genocide. We tried as a matter of national policy to wipe out its indigenous population. Moreover, we elevated that tragic experience into a noble crusade. Indeed, even today, we've not permitted ourselves to reject or feel remorse for this shameful episode. So one of the things as we talk about Native Americans is the understanding of Native American history. Um, I've taught history, 23, American history, 23 times in the past 15 years. Um, and I always begin with all the great accomplishments, which I'm only going to mention just a few here um, with Native Americans and ancient Native American history, um, the unparalleled uh, techniques in micro agriculture, macro environmental management, sustainable architecture, humanities, sciences, urban planning, democratic governments, our educational systems are, you know, all of these things look a little bit different to the West, but they were all in place, complex peacemaking strategies. In teaching this class uh, so many times, I always in, uh, have this first section on America before Columbus and have every class without uh, an exception, someone says, why didn't I learn all of this in college? Because I teach master students. Why didn't I learn all this in my private school? Or why didn't I learn all this in my high school? And my answer is always the same. You weren't supposed to. Native people of this hemisphere led a life that was in many ways much healthier and more tolerant of diversity than that of the European peoples. Native people utilized thousands of medicines and drugs, many of which are in the basis of today's modern medicines. Much of Native medicinal knowledge and practice has been lost due to the destruction of cultures, but still today over 500 medicines and herbal remedies 
are used in modern medical treatment that were first used by the peoples of America. And I'm just going to give you a couple, uh, three examples. Um, and by the way, you, you don't have to create giant cities of 40 and 50,000 people in order to be a great civilization. But um, I like to let people know the things that they don't know. Uh, and you may have heard of Cahokia. Uh, the myth of Cahokia is that there was one Cahokia. There were hundreds of Cahokias. There was only one preserved. In fact, all of East St. Louis was raised, uh, and it, it was uh, actually larger than Cahokia itself. But Cahokia was one of the largest urban centers in the world of its day, about 1200 AD, over 50,000 people. The city of Cahokia was only surpassed in size in America in eight, uh, 1800 AD by Philadelphia, long, in, uh, long after it had declined. Cahokia also, like most ancient Native American um, structures uh, in cities, had a, a astrological observatory. Only this one was uh, made uh, out of wood, kind of like they call it wood hinge today. Chaco Canyon in what is now New Mexico. This is a artist rendition uh, after archaeological discoveries. Between 900 and 1150, Chaco Canyon was a major center for culture for Pueblo peoples. By uh, 1115, at least 75 outlying cities had been built within the 30,000 square miles, composing agricultural communities, trading posts, and ceremonial sites in the San Juan Basin. They were connected to the Central Canyon and to one uh, another by six major Chacoan roads. The main roads extended to at least 60 roads well-researched and surveyed in generally straight routes, lit up at night as signal fires. Chaco also had a astrological observatory. The Pima Papago people or the Hohokam culture in Arizona in the Sonoran Desert. Um, since uh, circa 2000 BCE, they engineered in the seventh to the 14th centuries, a complex series of canals, weirs and irrigation networks with features of remarkable genius rivaling the sophistication of those used in the ancient Near East, Egypt, and China. Casa Grande was a notable structure that also was an astrological observatory. The 500 miles of canals irrigated 110,000 acres. The food produced by this advanced irrigation system believed to have been supported up to 80,000 people, the highest population density in prehistoric Southwest. And today they're still discovering this bottom picture on the right, um, these uh, ancient canals and, and use them for similar purposes or for uh, bicycle trails and things like this. So today, 65% of the world's foods are native to the Americas. Um, you can take a look, tamales, beans, tomatoes, peppers, mini peppers, all corn is Indian corn. There are over 5,000 varieties of Indian corn on this, uh, uh, in the Americas at the time of quote unquote discovery. Over 3,500 varieties of potatoes. Yes, Irish potatoes are Indian potatoes. Um, rubber chewing gum, sweet potatoes, etc. cetera. Um, many of these things come, or all these things come from Native America. Um, by the way, we, we, one of the reasons that we have a seed uh, company that feeds into our, our nonprofit is to, maintain heirloom varieties. Um, you see that over 5,000, 3,500, those are all down to about 10% of what they were uh, at the time of quote unquote discovery. Ben Franklin made an interesting observation. He said, when an Indian child has been brought up among us, taught our language and habituated to our customs, yet if he goes to see his relations, there is no persuading him ever to return. When white persons of either sex, so in other words, um, uh, when an Indian child goes back to his village, he won't come back. When white persons of either sex have lived a while among them, though ransomed by their friends and treated with all imaginable tenderness, in a short time they take the first opportunity of escaping into the woods from whence there is no reclaiming them. So in other words, um, those who have been captured by the Indians, quote unquote, escape white civilization, they're brought back to and live with the Indians.
this is a great quote. Um, it just embodies the idea that there was a lot going on here in the Americas that most people have no idea about because they're not supposed to know the, about those things. Uh, it would destroy the American myth. Native population estimates in North America. Uh, you can see that um, what became USA, Canada, and Mexico in 1491, about 100 to 160 million. And in 1620, that was reduced to 5 to 10 million. The area that became contiguous to, uh, contiguous to the United States, about 25 million in 1491. Um, the lowest uh, population decline at 250,000 around 1900. And then today at 2020, about 3.7 million. So we're making a comeback slowly. What happened to Native Americans? Well, the first wave of destruction was weather. About 150 year period, approximately 1125 to 1275 AD. America experienced several super droughts. This is part of the geological record. Some estimate that as a result, there was up to a 50% population loss. Um, this period coincides with the abandonment of Chaco Canyon, Cahokia Mounds, Okmulgee Mounds, Effigy Mounds, Gila cliff, cliff Dwellings, Chichen Itza in Mexico, and others. When these cycles of drought began, many of these civilizations were at their height. Communities were densely populated. Even with good rains, the people were likely using their land to its limits. Without rain, it was impossible to grow enough food to support the population. Widespread famine occurred by the 1300s. Um, this is just about 200 years before Columbus. Most of the large Native American cities had all but died out and new patterns began. And I think this is the lesson that uh, we're all going to have to learn again, especially places like Los Angeles and Las Vegas and some others. The second wave was disease. As much as 95% of the Indians died almost immediately on contact with various European diseases, particularly smallpox. That would have amounted to about one fifth of the world's total population at the time, a level of destruction unequaled before or since. These plagues wreaked havoc on traditional Indian societies. The quote unquote savages, most of the colonists saw without ever realizing it were usually the traumatized, destitute survivors of ancient and intricate civilizations that had collapsed almost overnight. In the end, the loss was incalculable. Excuse me. And the um, uh, there are actual records of uh, at the height of civilization, and then a hundred or so years later, people coming through and and just saying there was only like five percent. Um, uh, this happened with DeSoto and then LaSalle, who followed, for example. So uh, there's a lot of record of this kind of thing. And then the third destructive way was attempted genocide. Uh, Columbus said all these lands are densely populated with the best people under the sun. They have neither ill will nor treachery. And of course, colonization as a result of things like the doctrine of discovery, the uh, later manifest destiny, and uh, we have uh, um, corollary uh, movements going on today. Colonization begins with the land and ends with the mind, but the lands were Indian lands. And there are two uh, quotes I'd like to make by uh, uh, Taika Key Alfred, who uh, in a book from Peace, Power, and Righteousness and in Indigenous Manifesto, he said this, as I want us to think about, like uh, people always think about how to fix the problem. So, um, so this is directed toward that. The machinery of indigenous education may simply replicate European systems, but even if such education resemble traditional Native American systems on the surface, Without strong and healthy leaders committed to traditional values and the preservation of our nationhood, they are going to fail. Our children will judge them to, fail, to have failed because an education that is not based on traditional principles of respect and harmonious coexistence 
will inevitably tend to reflect the cold calculating and coercive ways of the modern state. The whole of the decolonization process will have been for nothing if indigenous education has no meaningful indigenous character. Worse, if the new education does not embody a notion of power that is appropriate to indigenous cultures, the goals of the struggle have been betrayed. Leaders who promote non-indigenous goals and embody non-indigenous values are simple tools used by the state to maintain its control. And we've seen a lot of that. Some of, uh, some of the worst ideas for Native Americans in history came from our so-called friends who wanted the best. Over 800 treaties were made between the Indian tribes and the United States, but few have been kept. So let's hear from the Indian side. Um, when we enter treaties with our brothers, the whites, their whole cry is for more land. You say, why not the Indians till the ground and live as we do? May we not with equal propriety ask, why do not the white people hunt and live as we do? The great God of nature has placed us in different situations. It's true that he has endowed you with many superior advantages, but he has not created us to be your slaves. We are separate people. Chief Anastosita, Cherokee, 1777. And one by Sitting Bull in 1880, the white man knows how to make everything, but he does not know how to distribute it. The love of possessions is a disease with them. They take tithes from the poor and weak to support the rich who rule. They claim this mother of ours, the earth, for their own and fence the neighbors away. So with all this untold trauma inflicted upon our own indigenous people, um, my own family uh, included, my wife's family included, um, my questions were this, as I began early on, my naive questions were, why are white people like that? Why did they do such things? And why do they continue to keep this system in place? And then I began to ask things like, well, what is whiteness? And then how did whiteness come to be? And then finally, to where I am now, understanding the Western worldview that created whiteness. Indigenous peoples learn naturally from our childhood forward that all things are related to one another. It takes dualistic thinking and extrinsic learning to create artificial categories of reality. And I'll go into that more later. In time, these categories become realities. Disintegration occurred in the West as a result of Platonic dualism between mind and flesh, spirit and body, material and ethereal. A disintegrated worldview has the advantage of being able to concentrate in depth on one category or specifics, but its deficit is the missing relationship of the extrinsic categories to all other things. In other words, holistic thinking. This comes out of my book, Shalom and the Community of Creation and Indigenous Vision. And then just the chart there, just to um, uh, tell you that um, the differences between indigenous thinking and Western thinking is really boils down to this idea of beliefs. And I'll, I'll get to why that is. Um, but as you can see, an indigenous uh, worldview has very little room for beliefs. Um, beliefs are what you do. If you ask an elder, and I've asked many elders this question, um, uh, and uh, he said, what are your beliefs? They'll tell you the things that they do. Whereas uh, Western society is really built on beliefs, whether it's church, Bible, holy books, constitutions, um, yeah, doctrine, et cetera, et cetera. It's primarily about beliefs. And if beliefs don't measure up with the practices, values, then basically there's always a justification for that. I only know of four ways of coming to know things, and I, it's really three, but I decided to put them into to four. And uh, in other words, what we call epistemology or ways of knowing. And we know by we know things by looking at creation. Um, it's our oldest teacher. It's our most in-depth teacher. It will always be here. We know things that are passed on from our community, our traditions. Um, and that that's the sort of uh, worldview things that are captured that that are caught more than they are taught. 
we know from our own hearts and our conscience that we don't want to be um, treated badly, so we don't treat others badly, that that we don't want to be stole from, and so we don't steal from others, those kinds of things. And then we know by our religions, our holy books, our scriptures, and things like that. So um, I would uh, argue that um, that as much as these things, and especially as I'm talking uh, to religious people, um, as much as uh, these things matter and we build our religions as a result of that, the problem is not so much with our theology, although crooked and bent as it is, but with the worldview that created those things. And uh, you might look at uh, Christians and deists uh, had a major influence in America and the forming and founding of America major literary styles of the Bible. Um, basically, the, uh, the, the Christian scriptures are 90% story. 90% story. So understanding story then becomes real important. But indigenous people and Western people don't look at story the same way. The Western way of propositional thinking, of you know uh, making points, and then maybe adding a story uh, at the end to emphasize what you're doing is is not really how indigenous people understand story. The West, I would argue, misinterprets the purpose of story, and that's what caused a lot of our problems in the past um, through religious people who are misinterpreting what they would call their own story. To indigenous peoples, the problems of a Western worldview are obvious. The way of life demonstrated by Western peoples leads to alienation from the earth, from others, and from all creation. It creates a false bubble called Western civilization in which the West feels will protect them from calamity and maintain homeostasis. This false hope is built on age-old philosophical ideas handed down from Greece, Rome, England, and other Western nation states. And then I ask the question, especially for those who are Christians, um, what can turn the people who call themselves by Christ's name into people who kill, steal, and destroy other people, lands, and nature with a genocidal passion? And this is my way of understanding it. So Plato, of course, was a student of Socrates. Um, we don't know how much of what Plato said. Um, really was Socrates or whether it was what Plato said Socrates said um, because they burned all his books. Um, that's been popular, I guess, for a long time um, in, in all his teachings, but Plato tried to resurrect this. Plato is began with this idea that a thing is not really the, a thing. In other words, what is physically before you is not really reality. What is reality is the idea that you ascribe to that thing. We call that the ethereal realm, and the other would be the material realm. realm. And so Plato then began in his philosophical teachings, um, part and parcel sort of baked in the bread of all that, was this idea um, that um, the ethereal is privileged above the material. So he created a hierarchy and a split in reality. Aristotle had a little different way of understanding that, but it was still a dualism. We call that Aristotelian dualism. Um, but Aristotle ended up having a lot of influence because uh, one of his students, uh, and, and Aristotle also, uh, here's, um, we should note, is also sometimes described as the father of modern race, uh, of scientific racism. Uh, he is the one who began uh, so long ago, 20. Uh, you know, almost 3,000 years ago, um, talking about Greek civilization as the highest form of humanity and meant to be served. And the barbarians and other uh, people across the, the world um, were known then uh, to be enslaved. And, um, and he even ascribed different metals and their value to the different peoples, but which is sort of how scientific racism sort of picked that up with craniology. Uh, later on, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Well, Aristotle had an influence on a, a young man. His name was Alexander, uh, last name the Great. I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, so Aristotle was his teacher as a young man. And uh, he bought hook, line, and sinker into Aristotle's idea of Greek civilization 
um, being the the primary uh, civilization that deserved all the power, uh, um, all the money, all the authority in the world. And so he spread what's called Hellenism or Greek thinking throughout the known world at that time. And at the top, you see Alexander's uh, world, you see um, the, um, the world of Rome uh, as it expanded, and then finally the world of Great Britain, which became then the inheritor of this idea. And um, one of the things that happened in Great Britain uh, was between the 14th and 17th centuries, uh, a renaissance came to take place. And it, it spread throughout all of Western Europe and even as far as Russia and some other places. But this uh, renaissance was the resurrection or the revival of Greek culture. And so Greek philosophy, uh, Greek ideas, um, Greek uh, thinkers, Greek architecture, Greek art, etc., cetera, um, then came into a revival of, uh, of Hellenism. And then there were two, um, uh, basically two movements that were born during this period of time. Um, the Enlightenment was one, which doubled down on Platonic dualism, perhaps most succinctly expressed by Rene Descartes, who stated, he is a soul, but merely has a body. Other Enlightenment thinkers include such men like John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Adam Smith, Immanuel Kant, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, and Thomas Jefferson. And so this covers a lot of areas. If you think about um, everything from economics and how we view nature and how we view human beings, et cetera, how we view freedom, all of those seat in Greek thinking. The other movement was the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation was heavily influenced by Platonic dualisms with doctrines teaching the separation of spirit and body, the primacy of the individual, orthodoxy over orthopraxis. Correct doctrine became so important that Protestants and Roman Catholics killed one another over their interpretation of scripture. This is also where the nation state, modern nation state came to be. And of course, this traveled over the seas to the Americas, um, the Puritans and the Pilgrims, especially um, uh, second governor of the Plymouth colony, William Bradford, when he came upon uh, a Wampanoag village that was, um, uh, everyone had died because of disease already without ever uh, maybe even seeing a white person, but um, a European, uh, and, but they found all these bones. And then they found stores and stores of corn and other foods that were buried. And his response was, the good hand of God favored our beginnings by sweeping away great multitudes of the natives that he might make room for us. Sort of a continuation of um, Aristotle's ideas here. And then um, Cotton Mather, the premier theologian of the Puritans, uh, said after um, massacring a peaceful Pequot village. In a little more than an hour, five or 600 of these barbarians were dismissed from a world that was burdened with them. It may be demanded, should not Christians have more mercy and compassion? But sometimes the scripture declareth women and children must perish with their parents. We had sufficient light from the word of God for our proceedings. This is where this is so important when it comes to understanding story. And I've listed some comparison. I'm just going to let you go down that list. I'm not going to uh, take a, I'll just take a minute here and uh, let you go down um, and uh, kind of compare this. I think it's an apples to apples comparison between a uh, Western worldview and an indigenous worldview. So just to, um, I'm not going to go through all of these things, but just a, a couple. Uh, dualism is sort of the foundational fallacy that I mentioned. You know, that is to invest in the ethereal, the spiritual, the metaphysical, the abstract realm to a higher degree than the physical. Um, our thoughts and our theologies become disembodied. Um, so that's why I'm so, so glad to hear you talk about 
everyone will walk away with one action point tonight. That, that sounded wonderful to me. Um, a split between what we call secular and sacred to believe that God is at work in the church or whatever your religion is more than in the whole world. Um, the physical land, good works, our bodies all become suspect. And it creates binary thinking so that things are all either right or wrong, legal or illegal, heaven or hell, sin or holiness, success or failure, civilized or primitive, introvert or extrovert, saved or lost, clean or dirty, weeds or plants, animals or environments. It makes it difficult for Western thinkers to hold two seemingly incompatible things in tension without having to find a resolution. It creates a false assumption that all things may be understood and every problem may be solved. The extrinsic compartmentalization is one of the things that comes out of this. This reductionism divides and erroneously classifies life into many parts with little attention to the whole, creates extrinsic, often unrelated categories that are partial realities. A partial reality can often become a false reality for getting the whole. So the idea then uh, becomes that um, uh, I'm like, we just take the medical field, for example. I have a cardiologist. I have a neurologist, I have a GP, a general practitioner, um, et cetera. But if any one of those begin to treat me without understanding the whole, um, I could be in real trouble. And that's the problem with extrinsic compartmentalization. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually can be very useful. Um, but when we start to act out of those categories as if they are the whole of reality is when things get out of balance. Hierarchies. In dualism, everything is ranked greater or lesser. Equality is wrong, or at least a not preferred system. The results of historical Western structured systems have created dehumanization by class, race, ethnicity, gender, religion, nationality, etc., Anthropocentrism is one of those hierarchies that humans are above nature. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go on from there. Utopianism, a shared myth of most movements, living for another world in the future or the past. And it negates, utopianism negates our human frailty, what it means just to be a human being, and it seeks perfection. And the ends the ends for the other world that you're trying to gain, always end up justifying the means. And those means are not always good in this world. Individualism, loss of the corporate and the community. When you look at the Christian scriptures, for example, they were never written for a me, but they were written from um, and for uh, a we, not for an individualistic worldview. These were not written by Enlightenment-bound people with individualism. They were written for communal-based, more tribal-type people. Uh, creates competitiveness over cooperation and a majority rule over consensus. I, I don't know how people think this is the best democratic system in the world when 51% of the people can be happy and 49% can be miserable. Um, we operate by consensus. And white supremacy, the idea that white, light-skinned, Western European descent people have the inherent right to control all governance, knowledge, wealth, and power in any given system. It's a symptom of otherism. The Greeks had their barbarians. The Romans had their savages. The English had their heathen. North Americans have had Native Americans, African Americans, LGBTQ, immigrants, Muslims, etc., as the other and creates intolerance for difference. Laws and other systems are formed to maintain control. Modern expressions of white normalcy and white privilege are created by these laws, such as Jim Crow, redlining, and other things. They don't need to be actual laws. They can just be common laws. And here's one example of this, uh, where this has led um, generational wealth, we talk about generational wealth among whites, 1.5 million whites were given 160 acres of land grants in the 19th century, 160, uh, yes, 12% uh, of the white population at that time. 
Roughly 350 million white descendants of those people are alive today who benefited directly from white generational wealth. Indian removals, genocidal campaigns, enslavement, relocations, segregation, redlining, eminent domain, etc., fueled by doctrines of discovery, manifestation, manifest destiny, miscegenation, and American exceptionalism, which is what it's disguised as today. And of course, materialism. So that's the philosophical background. So how do we relate then to creation? And when I say creation, I mean the whole community of creation, which for me includes the birds, the insects, the animals, um, the trees, the plants, etc. cetera. Um, so there's an ancient Cherokee story, um, sort of our story, a little bit like, uh, kind of like the Genesis one and two and three story. Um, and we're really more like the Genesis one through 11 story where uh, what we would call Shalom is broken. But the story is told that um, the Cherokee people began to misuse the animals and plants and things. And so when they would kill an animal, they would take only the best parts and they wouldn't be grateful. And, uh, and so the animals decided to have a council and they all got together. And this would be all the birds and the insects and the, the animals, et cetera. And, uh, and they said, well, these people are killing us. We're going to have to kill them back. What do we do? So the bears were in charge and the bears said, well, let's, how are they killing us? And they said, well, bows and arrows. And so they said, well, let's, let's go make bows and arrows and kill them back. So they started to create these bow and arrows, but the bears have these big long claws and uh, they couldn't get any accuracy at all. Arrows were flying everywhere. So the rest of the animals said, you know, bears, you've had your turn. They set them down and, uh, uh, and they connected uh, or elected, I should say, um, the grub worm to lead them. And so the grub worm began to get the ideas from all the different uh, animal peoples and the birds and insects. And, and they finally came up with this idea. And the idea was, Let's put disease on the people. That'll teach them. And so they began to think of all these diseases and then put them on the Cherokee people. So they put smallpox and um, chickenpox and influenzas and uh, yeah, all kinds of diseases. And so the people began to die. And finally, when everyone was dying, the young people, the old people, the, the men and the women, they decided that you know they had to um, change the way they do things. And so they went to the animal people and said, you know, we're all dying. We're not going to be around anymore. If you would please just um, stop doing this, you know, we will uh, start acting better. But the animals decided, no, we won't do that. And so the Cherokee people continued to die. And this whole time, the plant people were watching this and the plants felt sorry for the people. And so they decided to start sending plant medicine they would cure all these animal diseases and they sent them in people's dreams. And one by one, these diseases started going away. And even today, uh, our Cherokee people believe that um, there's a, a plant medicine for every disease on earth. So um, they, they all got together, the plant people, the Cherokees and the uh, animal, insect, birds, et cetera. And they decided from now on what would happen is that when a, uh, a human being kills an animal, that it only kills what it needs. And that based on what it killed, that it would use every part of it. And that it would also, that human being would put down tobacco and say a prayer of thanks to the earth, to the animal, to creator, and uh, be grateful for what they have. And they would do the same when they pick a plant or a tree. And what I learned from that, from hearing that story so many times is this, that, that we can learn from our mistakes. There's a lot more I can say, but basically, that we learn from our mistakes, that we can allow creation to teach us, that it takes the whole community of creation to keep the balance. And that we need to maintain gratitude and ceremony. 
in the scripture, the Christian scriptures, you have in the Jewish scriptures, you have this word dominion that has caused a lot of trouble. Dominion is a good word if you're King James and you're creating, you're a king and you want to control things. Dominion is a great word to use. And of course, everybody took it to mean that. But unfortunately, that's not the context nor the way that that word is always translated. What it also is translated is to take responsibility for, to be an agent responsible to assure the well-being of those in your care. That's what the context of that passage is. In other words, to be a co-sustainer of the whole community of creation, um, to keep it in balance. We call that Elohe in uh, Cherokee, Shalom in Hebrew. A general way of looking at it is the harmony way. The, the West has largely failed in its mandate to till and keep the soil, quoting the scriptures. That is to tend the garden and serve the community of creation, in part due to a radical misunderstanding of humanity's place within the created order, a flaw in the Western worldview. So as I look at those passages, um, here's what I understand them to mean. That creation is harmonious and balanced. That first chapter of Genesis is a beautiful chapter of this beautiful harmony and balance in the world. That humans are made specifically, the last ones created, specifically to be the only ones who are qualified to keep that harmony. And that what is called original sin in the story is actually the misuse of land. It's a misuse of uh, the land, uh, the rules about land that creator gave. And disharmony occurs, or ecocide, and leads to broken relationships, blame, marginalization, and subjugation, and then into ethnocide and patriarchy. I think we were all born to be indigenous. Um, and I use the small I and the capital I for that. Um, I use that capital I for the second definition here of a people inhabiting or existing in a land from the earliest times or from before the arrival of colonization. I, that small I use for people originating or occurring naturally in a particular place, native. <clears throat> we're born to be indigenous as human beings. That's our role, that's our job. But we are not raised to be indigenous. Even though I believe we're all indigenous for somewhere deep in our DNAs, we have that indigeneity, our people, lived with the land in order to survive. We all need to realize our indigeneity in order to rehumanize ourselves. So what does it mean then um, for us as human beings when we see ourselves apart from the earth rather than part of the earth? Well, one of the things it means is that we're not recognizing the very fact that we're made of most of the same um, minerals and uh, 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 metals and everything else that the earth is made out of. Also, um, it, we forget that about, um, if you're a 200 pound person, um, about 12% of your body weight are actual um, microscopic organisms. You're carrying around living organisms. Um, each human might carry as much as 39 trillion microbial cells that actually influence our well-being. So one cup of healthy soil contains all of these things, folks. Um, 200 billion bacteria, 20 million protozoa, 100,000 meters of fungi, etc. All that in one healthy cup of soil. So functionally, to be human is to be a co-sustainer of the literal earth. We, the earth is a part of us, the same microbes. To keep harmony in the world or the whole community uh, is the, keep harmony in the whole community of creation or to be indigenous. That's our role. And I, when I talk about the whole community of creation, I'm not just talking about the earth or animals or plants. Um, yes, you might be uh, keeping harmony if you are um, taking care of your soil or protecting a, um, a watershed or a river or something like that. But you also are keeping harmony and balance wherever harmony and balance has been broken. 
So if it's for missing and murdering indigenous women or human trafficking or bringing water to Flint, Michigan or things such as this, these are all acts of humanity, restoring our humanity through our indigeneity. The Karuk um, have a fixing the world ceremony called Pikyavish. And I've been to their ceremony a long time ago and I watched and every year for who knows time immemorial, the Karuk have come together once a year and they have ceremony and they sing and they dance and they, they feast and they pray to fix the world. They see it as their job as human beings to fix the world. We all need to be more like them. So our own indigeneity is stolen by the Western worldview through some of these things. And part of that, um, part of that myth is the idea of progressive civilization. Um, one of my favorite authors, John Mohawk said, for the most part, contemporary historians have proceeded from the presumption that modern people are different from and superior to those who came before, especially those designated as primitives. These accounts serve to reinforce a sense of difference and to distance moderns from unflattering legacies of the past. So I know I'm, I need to go a little uh, quickly here. So um, Western Europe at the time, uh, the late Middle Ages, the time of quote unquote discovery, what was going on? Deforestation, war, topsoil being depleted, oceans and bays polluted and fished out, rivers and streams undrinkable, air pollution, making breathing unhealthy, disease killing tens of thousands, large mammals going extinct, et cetera, et cetera. That was happening at, in the time of quote unquote discovery in Europe. And now the same things have happened here. And the thing that hasn't changed is the Western worldview. In over 530 years, the Western worldview in America has not done the earth nor the world much good. I call it a failed experiment. CO2 is now being released in the atmosphere faster than any time in the past 66 million years. And it's not like we haven't known about this. This uh, article is from 1912, and they talk about this increase of uh, burning fossil fuels and how it may affect uh, the earth and raise its temperature. 1912, people don't have a will to change. Western worldview has devised ways to forget how to live with and care for creation. Topsoils disappearing, forests are shrinking, desertification, coral reefs, etc. And yet indigenous people have lived here for at least 28,000 years, and now we're beginning to say maybe 100 to 250,000 years without permanently endangering the land. So I've been keeping track of these things since about 1999, um, when there was no Google, um, and uh, still keeping track of them. Now it's pretty easy to get charts like this, but basically there's just the increase of frequency and, um, and severity of uh, almost all disasters, what we call natural disasters. The Washington and Oregon uh, average temperature has been on the rise since 1950. You can see the average rise. And I'm going to try not to uh, um, get bogged down too much with this, but to I, I understand, understand that that the majority of um, uh, energy that is observed from the sun here, uh, number one, is through phytoplankton. That supplies about one third of the Earth's oxygen. Um, and then the primary consumer of the the big part, the biggest part of the Earth's energy, are zooplankton or plankton. Secondary consumers are fish and human beings and other large mammals are what we call tertiary consumers. So you see this sort of a hierarchy, if you will, of the natural order of things. <clears throat> Humans have moved from tertiary consumers to becoming primary consumers, expending energy beyond the earth's natural cycles and recharge rates, creating imbalance and disharmony. The earth is forced to consume then 
the new primary consumer, humanity, in order to restore the balance of energy in the way it was intended for the whole community of creation. So there's nothing singular in the whole universe from subatomic quarks to the macroverse and multiverse. Um, it's nature's DNA, is unity and diversity. Um, it's a natural way of building, but it's not our way. Our building looks more like this. What we think of as order and stable is actually falling apart. And nature's chaos, if I'm right about this, Nature's chaos is actually stability. And the reason I believe this is because the number one rule of nature is adaptation. Adaptation is stability. Great mystery builds in open systems like fractals. They contain both unity and diversity via their nature. Homogeneous closed systems are actually built to die. Homogeneous race, age, gender, monocultural hybrid, GMO crops, etc., lead to eventual destruction. The nature of a closed system must collapse in on itself or be consumed by other more adaptive systems. The nature of open systems is to adapt. Order is the reality of planning and perseverance in sustainable systems. Order works with entropy, not against it, building open, adaptable systems of unity and diversity. Chaos is attempting to fight entropy through unsustainable, closed, non-adaptive systems. Climate change, zoonosis, the transfer from uh, animal disease to humans, um, are a result of the Western world's rejection of natural laws given by creator, I would argue. Nature adapts to survive. Under the present circumstances, the final adaptation of nature is human extinction. We only have a short time to come back from our own unsustainable chaos and back to a sustainable order. So what I'm saying is for millennia, the whole of creation has been producing enough energy to allow humans a limited consumption. Humanity in just a few generations has accelerated consumption exponentially. We call that the Anthropocene. Mother Earth is now trying to rebalance the overuse through random acts of nature. She is reclaiming her territory, spitting out the inhabitants in order to restore harmony. The top of the food chain is now Mother Earth herself. I don't call it the Anthropocene, but I call it the Europatrocene. And um, you can read ahead here because I'm going to go a little faster um, just to make this observation um, by Jairus Grove, uh, PhD at the University of Hawaii. It was a European elite that developed a distinctively mechanistic view of matter, an oppositional relationship to nature, and an economic system indebted to geographical expansion. The resulting political orders measured success by how much wealth could be generated in the exploitation of peoples and resources. So I also want to draw your attention about the correlation between the Western worldview's treatment of nature and of people, particular peoples. Um, there's a corollary between how European Americans treat creation and people, especially women, the cultural, racial, gendered immigrant other, and the poor. And what they have in common is to control, to objectify, to expect production from, to exploit, to serve at one's pleasure, a variable rape culture. And yet humanity is meant to be in direct relationship with, with creation. This the oldest book in the Christian scriptures and is Job. It says, but ask the animals and they will teach you. Or the birds of the air and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you or let the fish of the sea inform you. Chief Sale said, humankind has not woven the web of life, but we are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together, all things connect. In a Western Enlightenment worldview, human beings can be categorized apart from creation, 
The result is a false dichotomy between physical earth and spiritual beings. In a harmony worldview, human beings are understood as fully physical and earth is fully spiritual. Healing, therefore, by definition, should always consider the healing of people, the healing of our histories, the healing of all creation, what I call the whole community of creation. All creation is sacred, and there's a problem with worldview when one is considered sacred and not the other. People can still embody the whole of ourselves to fix the world. I'm concerned about the common good right now in particular, structurally and actively and passively. Love is abundant. I've seen it, including peace, mercy, justice, hospitality, restitution, and a whole plethora of characteristics and expressions for the common good, and for which the byproduct is also good for individuals. Harmony Way is not ethereal or utopian in nature, but very real. The Harmony Way can be clearly identified, and it's communal in nature, not being satisfied just to seek the good of the individual, but seeks the common good, and it benefits the whole community in identifiable and tangible ways. Could it be, depending on your belief, but let's just call it the universe, is the most vulnerable being who exists? If God is love, and love means being vulnerable, then God must represent the essence of vulnerability. In Creator's vulnerability, we are invited to become fellow human beings with others who are different from us, to exchange and empower dignity in ourselves and others, to join in reciprocal conversation, con, uh, conversion of each other's understanding of truth, and to live with, for, and among the community of creation, including people in harmony. The opposite of vulnerability is superficiality. The opposite of vulnerability is indifference. It's control, including the illegitimate use of power, the misuse of power being among the primary failures of colonizers or religion. Steps for the West, adaptability, intentionality, inclusive group experiences, education by BIPOC, no longer in your comfort zone, exploring and embracing diversity narratives, no longer monocultural white myths, racially diverse leadership, sharing power, no longer tokenism, Self-deprecating humor, not taking ourselves too seriously. And embodied, empowered churches or congregations as centers of proactive change, no longer dualistic, bodied milk toast. And just a caveat here, indigenous peoples don't own creation or have a patent on nature. Creation is there for all to enjoy and be inspired by. Any culture who spends their lives in the outdoors learns to respect creation. Everyone should have similar respect and reverence for all creation and enjoy history and ceremonies and songs that affirm all parts of creation in their local regions. Um, I'm just going to read this um, first paragraph here. People must rightly declare a corrective social location in order to begin healing. Unless Americans are willing to divest themselves of the wrong social location and its associated power, they cannot hope to create an honest view of the land. As a result of having lived a false postulated narrative of the American myth of the land, an alternative narrative has been constructed. The unjust social location has created a land of injustice. And my friend Adrian Jacobs said it this way, as in any recovery from debilitating social cultural problems, the journey begins with, hello, my name is blank. I have a problem. I'm proposing that Aboriginal culture worldview frame of reference offers hope to Western peoples. Aboriginal people are your, are not your problem. We are your cure. We are the conscious of your technology. We are the humanizers of your institutions. We matter quite apart from your recognition of our worth. We are a threat to the entrenched powers that be who refuse to open the doors of opportunity and choice to all. We are a challenge to the mindset of greed, calling for the equitable distribution of resources and the spirit of the Jewish year of Jubilee. We are good medicine for you. And 
I think you probably can just go to alahey.org and see what we're up to. I won't take the time to do that right now. Um, but um, we've been on this journey for quite a while and are finally getting somewhere. One of the Shoshone elders said this, don't begrudge the white man his presence on the land. Though he doesn't know it yet, he's come here to learn from us. And I'll stop right there and we can uh, go to the next part of the program. Wow. A lot to digest there, uh, Dr. Woodley. <laughs> Absolutely a lot. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> we wanted to do was do uh, breakouts, take this time and opportunity to be able to put people in smaller rooms um, and allow them to discuss what they're trying to digest um, from what you fed us for this uh, last 40 minutes. Uh, there's a lot in there to discuss. We want to be able to give people opportunity to be able to speak about that and ask questions. So that was something that we hope we could do and then come back from that in about 15 minutes or so and then be able to um, present some of those questions to you. Sounds wonderful. Absolutely. All right. Well, this time, let's go ahead and get into our rooms. Uh, Adil, welcome back, Dr. Woodley. Thank you. Yes. We had uh, a great breakout ourselves. I hope everyone did. Um, hopefully, we're getting everyone back in here. Um, I, I want to start off by saying you are such an amazing wealth of knowledge. I could sit with you forever. <laughs> There's Thank you. so many questions that um, I could go into, but obviously for the sake of time, um, you know, we have to limit it. I've got some questions coming in. And um, if you don't mind, I'll start to toss those in. I think people are getting in here. Says um, one of the first ones in here says, You said we don't know about the history of indigenous people because we weren't supposed to know. As more of history is revealed, is there an effort to suppress the sharing of historical facts and information? Dr. Woodley? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're in danger right now of a suppression of lots of different perspectives. Um, uh, anything that sort of disagrees with the mythical notion of white America. And so, yeah, we're still in danger of that. Um, but Native American history has really rarely been taught from a Native perspective. One of the things I did was I led a group of 50 people on a something uh, back in uh, 2003. Um, it was the sort of uh, looking at where uh, this harmony had been broken in Americas. And we took two weeks on a bus um, with the Cherokee Trail of Tears, which I led, and two weeks on a bus from the Freedom Trail, and the Civil Rights Trail um, that someone mm -hmm. else led. And, um, and the thing that I continued to, to draw people's attention to was like, what's the meta narrative? What's the story behind the story? And how does it differ? Mm -hmm. Native people are telling their own story and when white people are telling the story for them and they began to see through it constantly. And there's just a different um, understanding of the world and history um, through what has generally been taught as history in America. It's a mythological um, history. Um, and first thing I, I say in my courses has always been, there's no such thing as history. And people look at me like, well, why am I in this course then? It's like, I said, there's only histories. And mm -hmm. until we get as many histories as uh, that we can, credible histories, we don't really understand what the truth is. And we create our own myths. And then we live by those myths. Mm -hmm. And that's America has been built living by a particular myth. And now that myth is beginning to fall apart and people are reacting to that. Interesting that you say that because one of the questions um, was that I, I personally have I've never attended George Fox, but I've done a lot with the school. How, I, first of all, we think it's beautiful that they accepted you and brought you in to be able to tell this, but how was that navigating with a very conservative Christian um, system? Yeah. 
Well, first of all, the master's level uh, uh, seminary is not as conservative as the undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And I was basically kicked out of the undergraduate for corrupting young minds um, really? at one point. Um, so, uh, and I had uh, caused a lot of good trouble in uh, in my 15 years there. Um, and uh, if I had time to go into the personal stories and maybe around a campfire, I might do that with somebody, but maybe not now's the time. But just believe me that I, I caused a lot of good trouble and uh, they were very happy to eventually see me go. So, wow. yeah. Very, like I said, that's something that we could definitely dive into and talk about for a long time. One of the other questions was, uh, in your opinion, what is religion and how is it different than spirituality? Oh, that's a kind of a deep question. I, as I kind of answer that for myself, spirituality is being a human being. Um, I think that um, being uh, human, the way that we were made to be human, that means to be vulnerable and to, to be keepers of uh, harmony is the most spiritual you can be this to me when when we are vulnerable human beings admitting our humanity that's the height of spirituality i think rigid religion is simply when we we sort of um take the notions of that and then we build it around certain myths and artifacts and things like that um, but i would say it's the 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 sort of quest that we all have is to find the sort of the a, a a meeting or an intersection of the the ultimate and the intimate um and when we find that uh i think that sort of makes religion um and we build certain histories and artifacts around that but um i think all human beings are spiritual and and the more human we can become the more spiritual we'll be wow okay um one of the questions here was, do you see improvement being made in any of these areas that you talked about? And um, do you find hope anywhere? It's really interesting question. I'm sorry, DJ, the last part cut it out when you cut out when you said de you define something, define. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm sorry. Hopefully. Uh, do you see improvement being made in any of the areas that you talked about? And do you find hope anywhere? Oh, hope. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah sorry. I actually <laughs> do. Yeah. Thank you. It was, it was not your fault. It was the uh, connection, I think. Um, yeah, I, I see uh, lots going on. I mean, I, a, a lot of people are um, sort of waking up to the fact, I think part of, part of the impetus for that is uh, as people of color and queer people and other people all begin to have voices and more platform um, and they're that they're having a bigger effect and that people are then um, surprisingly a lot of people I think at least the ones I come across are open to saying hmm that's not the story that I learned so now I need to learn something else and I'm especially hopeful for uh, Gen Zs and millennials, although they don't like to be grouped together, um, because uh, especially the Gen Zs are, um, they are rejecting the paradigm that was handed to them. So they are the sort of the, the edge of the spear, if you will, or the point of the spear um, in this movement to reject this paradigm. And uh uh, and they don't, they don't want this. And so to me, that's a very, very hopeful thing. Um, it was very hopeful to see um, so many uh, tens of thousands of students walk out in Nashville at the Nashville schools today and protest on the lawns of the Capitol uh, about gun control. Um, these were all high school students um, who are tired of it. They they don't want the same paradigm, and um, we've got to be able to uh, allow them or help them find ways to put more pressure on our politicians and and uh, corporations. Yeah, great. That actually goes with another question that's in here. How can we channel chaos to dismantle racism and help heal the land? 
So by my definition of chaos, that means we need to give up um, our homeostatic um, structures. So we need to reform our structures into more adaptive structures um, that will work with entropy, that will work with adaptation. And, um, you know, the, um, uh, oh, at the same time, I don't know if people saw the news today, but at the same time in Florida, there was a closed meeting where the governor uh, signed a bill that allowed um, anyone without any um, uh, uh, training or anything to purchase and carry a concealed weapon. So we have this action and reaction, right, that's happening. Um, and uh, yeah, so the the homeostatic rigid sort of uh, vanguard will always be there um but you know we have to be wise and we have to be influential and we have to understand where to put our money and where to keep our money away from in order to change structures and corporations and um, one of the the fastest things that we can do to begin to um, protect the earth and uh, sort of insulate against these kinds of changes is to create rights of nature laws. And they're doing that all over the United States. Um, you know, uh, Santa Monica, California has protected its water, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, you know, and then other places around the world. So, um, and there are a number of organizations on our website like the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature and others. If you go to our website and you look in, uh, uh, one of the sections is about the land. And then I list um, five or six organizations who are who have lots of resources on their websites and, and personal help to help you protect your watersheds or protect, you know, whatever it is that, that you want to try and find, uh, give uh, earth rights to. And so um, I think that's the fastest way to uh, begin to make the changes. Okay, great. Uh, while we're on the subject, would you make sure to plug your website? Yeah, Pop it's up. yeah, alahey.org, E L O, but I'll put it in the chat here. If, uh, okay, so. Great. Um, with that, while you're doing that, one of the questions that we had was could you expand on your four questions in the trauma inflicted by whiteness? Um, number one, why are white people like this? Um, what is whiteness? Number two, number three, how do um, how did whiteness come to be? And number four, understanding the Western worldview that uh, created whiteness. Yeah, so I I think this is sort of a natural cycle maybe for us all when we start uh, realizing this as young people and things. We're you know we see the injustice, we see the injustice coming. Um, uh, on our group, uh, seemingly from white folks, and mm -hmm. and we wonder like why are they like that, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then I mean we have lots of rationales or reasons, and sometimes we get stuck in that cycle, right? Of like, oh, mm -hmm. it's white people's fault, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, but then you begin to, if you continue to look farther, you know, what is whiteness? You know, you don't even have to be white to be a part of whiteness as a system, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and so you start realizing, well, this is something that's systemic. It moves beyond people. It moves beyond greed. It moves beyond all these things. And uh, to finally mm -hmm. begin to um, like, well, where did this come from? And then, um, you know, as a historian, um, it was very interesting for me to begin to put together these age-old philosophies and their influence on Western civilization and realize that all this was part of the Western mindset mm -hmm. um, that went into it. And we're all, um, basically, it's, it's baked in the bread of all of our systems, whether it be economics, education, law, judicial, political, et cetera, the, the um, uh, the Western worldview, which created whiteness, is is uh, endemic to all of those areas of of life, and so we have to begin to change those. Great, I'm, I'm glad to hear you elaborate on that because, again, um, I think that that's one of the things that's missed in our society is that 
it's a mindset. It has nothing necessarily to do with someone's pigment. Um, exactly. That was that was great. One of the other questions that came in was, um, what is the role? Please comment on the role of women in indigenous cultures. Well, there's no such thing as indigenous culture, so I can't speak for um, all the tribes or anything like that, you know. Um, but uh, traditionally, um, as even from the Ben Franklin quote, you know, a lot of women who were captives would would run away from white society, Boston colony and the rest, and run back to Native American society because they had much many more rights. And so um, a lot of the uh, our tribes, not all uh, by any means, but many of our tribes are matrilineal. Uh, my tribe is, is matrilineal. Women had certain rights that men didn't have um, and vice versa. Um, it was not a matter of, uh, well, was, the English used to really complain with our Cherokees because they uh, they would try to get an answer about the simplest things they would say. And, uh, and then the people would meet in their council houses and discuss it with every person in the village got a voice. And they would meet for three to four days. And these were English officers and stuff who were complaining of this. And, and one of the things they, they called us because they said, we even allow our women to speak. And so they called us a petticoat government. Um, so um, women have uh, traditionally in, I won't say all, because I don't know all, but many, many indigenous societies always held a a higher place than in uh, the Western um, society in America. So, wow, great information. <clears throat> I know it's it's approaching that hour, and and you said at eight thirty. I think you turned into a pumpkin or something. I'm okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got a few more questions. I want to get out of here. Uh, one of them was, do you have any information to share regarding relationships between um, the Black cultures and uh, Native Americans as colonizers were settling in North America? Yeah, well, there's such a, a rich history between um, African-American and Native American peoples, um, both good and bad. So um, mm -hmm. there were, you know, most people don't know that indigenous people were enslaved for 70 years before the first West African um, enslaved person came over. And so um, we were being sent down to the Bahamas and all of that. And this is one of the reasons why there's such a, uh, it, it's uh, fairly common for black folks to say I have native ancestry because mm -hmm. they probably do. Um, so, and then also a lot of uh, um, enslaved peoples who got free would run away to, especially in the Southeast to, and in the South to different Choctaw, Cherokee, um, Seminole, especially uh, Muscogee villages, and then become a part of the tribe. Um, several of the most famous uh, uh, Seminole chiefs, Billy Horse, for example, um, was a uh, um, uh, mixed Native American, African American. Um, but then there's also the sort of the, the the other side of things. So some of the Cherokees who, uh, especially those who are in like North Georgia, who had kind of assimilated to white society and values, then, then owned enslaved people. Um, and, um, and then uh, on the other side of that, Many of those who were uh, enslaved, who came out and had no way to make a living, went out into the West and became what they called Buffalo soldiers and um, fought against Native Americans. And so, you know, there's all of that history. Uh, so it's a it's a very you can't talk about black history or native history without talking about the the other. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. So much to digest there, um, Dr. Woodley. I mean, we could we could go on and on forever. Um, again, I know we're running short on time and uh, we thank you and we respect your time. One of the things that we wanna make sure that we ask is uh, there's been questions about being able to come out and visit and tour um, your facility. And is that an opportunity and something that people- Absolutely, do? yeah. Since since Dawn has uh, been out and volunteered, she's earned the right to be in charge of that group. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dawn. We appreciate it. <laughs> I also understand we also have Nancy in here too that says that she has been out several times. Um, oh, there's yeah, I saw several people. Uh, yeah, I, that that have been out to 
Uh, I can't page, stroll through the pages while we're talking. Yeah, so, yeah I saw when they first start coming on, uh, three or four people who have been out here and been very faithful in helping us. And so we're really appreciative of everyone. Yeah. Yes. So I understand that there, uh, I want to get clarity on this because there was a question of whether or not people can only go at one day or one time, or can they go at any given time, but there's one directed time for a group. Can you yeah. elaborate on that? Just yeah, make so sure it's easiest on us. That they it's easiest on us probably this summer because we're traveling a lot um, to, uh, but we're here uh, for every volunteer Saturday. We've had the first two canceled for February and March because of snow and ice. So we're really anxious to get people helping. Um, lots to do. But uh, yeah, the last Saturday of every month is a volunteer day. But um, we also can take people at, at other times as well, as long as we're going to be here and be around. So. Okay, great, great. So people can come out and volunteer and help help you guys as well. Absolutely. And okay. we can also include a tour with that, you know. Good deal. Well, with all that being said, <clears throat> we would sincerely like to thank you for your time and all that you have given us tonight, but also everything that you do in general with, you know, spreading the word and giving us a great perspective on so much that is not being taught. So um, with that being said, uh, big thanks to you, Reverend Dr. Randy Woodley, Mr. PhD. I can keep going on with all the names and things that we have here. <laughs> well, DJ, I have uh, two minutes left. Can I say a word before I go? Absolutely. Plug okay. Anything. So first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here. And, and I got to tell you, I learned something uh, about this whole journey. Uh, Lake Oswego, just based on everything I heard, would be the last place that I would imagine responding to racism to be coming from. So I am really happy. I'm happy with the, the statements that were read and what you are doing, and I'm very proud of you. And then um, the other thing that I would say, in which everybody always uh, wants to know, well, like, well, how do we, this is so big, how do we change it? And I just have a a philosophy I've sort of been personal philosophy I've been living with for the last 35 years. And that is me, my world and the world. And if I can have integrity in my own self and what I'm doing to resolve the problem, um, then I, I have integrity to step into my community and do those kinds of things to whether it be my school or church or synagogue or uh, my uh, workplace or whatever and affect change in those places. And maybe, maybe if I have integrity with that, that I might actually get a chance to change the world. And so um, we've just got to be, you know, doing the right thing in our own context and then uh, watch and see what happens. Well, thank you for doing that. And it's tough a lot of times to be able to stand up and speak something that a lot of times isn't popular because people have other beliefs so it's it's oh, and i know it very hard for someone to believe something and know something and speak up a lot of times because they know should i can get you go and get some rest big thanks to uh from everyone in here uh definitely our respondent race group they are absolutely as you said doing an amazing job uh willie miss willie terry pat um Everybody, Trina, they're doing a great job, and I'm proud to be able to help out and get an opportunity to hear your message and help you share your message. So we just want to thank you. And, um, All right. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. To continue to do what you do. All right. With that said, thank you to everybody that one that's been a part of this meeting. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, we do apologize. We want to try to get in as much as we absolutely could and allow him to be able to expound on his responses. So thank you all. Thank you for watching another RTR production of Respond to Racism's monthly community meeting. To find out more information about Respond to Racism and today's meeting, visit www.respondtoracism.org and consider making a donation through our website to support future meetings and community events.